Welcome to the Age of Vision Radio Show with your host, Ronnie Clark, where we learn to accept living in a world transformed by Fukushima. Monday, Wednesday, and Friday from 8 a.m. to 9 a.m. Pacific Standard Time here on UCY.TV, we relentlessly engage every ear that listens. We share information about the facts of radiation and the nuclear industry. We discuss vital current events and explore the roots of social engineering that has caused so many of our beloved friends and family to intentionally ignore the most critical, catastrophic event in human history. We interview activists to do the hard work to discover the truth and get the word out. We dispose the NRC's daily nuclear alerts and take phone calls from our listeners in an effort to fully engage on all topics that are changing our world. We explore exactly how radiation affects our bodies and minds to dissipate your fears and face the truth. We remind our listeners that happiness is resistance. Love is greater than fear. We share information on how to take your life back from the systems intent on enslaving our bodies, minds, and souls. The Age of Vision radio show will create a venue that all will choose in order to actively engage to save our planet from the ravages of greed and indifference. Y.TV radio, radio listeners. This is Lonnie, this is Lonnie Clark. Clark. Uh, we seem to have a bit of an echo. I hope that it doesn't come through to you. Uh, hold on just one second. I have Thomas Ackerman on the line, and we'll be speaking with him later uh, in just a few minutes about uh, our new ideas about how we're going to help make this movement a real active movement and help people gain, gain the courage and actually just the desire to face the age of fission, which is what we're living in right now. Ever since Fukushima blew up, uh, things have just gotten progressively worse. We, you know, They may have prevented us from living in the age of fission four years ago, and can you believe it, shockingly, almost five years ago. We are five years in since the Fukushima catastrophe, and even just yesterday we hear... They are still covering up a young man who was 30 years old, died at the site, and they are giving us bits of misinformation. All we know is that somebody died. He was working there for 30 minutes and then died. That's the information I read. So it is time for us to actually just learn how to embrace living in the age of fission and stop being angry about it. You know, um... One of the things I really want to bring up right away is the comments section on the UCY.TV YouTube video section. We got I got a really great comment from a gentleman named Eric Oppenheimer saying, stop yelling at your listeners. I actually was not yelling, but I actually do get excited. So you have to forgive me if it sounds like I'm yelling sometimes. Uh, I'll make an effort to be more calm when I'm on the radio so I don't sound like I'm yelling at people. But... Um, you know, one of the things we need to do is really figure out a way to how to actively engage and make this something that people are willing to acknowledge, face, and find solutions. Uh, you know, I'm, I'm an eternal optimist. I, I believe that we can find a solution. The reason that Fukushima is so completely out of control is because they've never really tried to find a solution. I mean, they say they're going to build an ice wall. They knew before they even did that project it wasn't going to work. Part of the reason that they're having such a hard time about it is they're not admitting what the situation really is. They've never, ever come clean that we have nuclear power plants in the state of fission, which is basically what they call the China syndrome. We have the China syndrome going on on our planet, something we have never seen. In this article that I'm reading on my uh, YouTube channel, 
It's called The Safety of Nuclear Power. Dr. Weinberg talks about the potential for the China Syndrome, the possibility of a China Syndrome, and how in that time, it was in 1972 when this talk was given, uh, how they were thinking about the theory of the China Syndrome, but it was unacknowledged, they unproven, and there was no way to prove it. And that it would never happen because they would safeguard, they considered themselves in this article that I'm reading, and that's why it's so completely critical. Dr. Weinberg talks about, he uses the first phrase, he calls themselves, he goes, we have now set up a, a situation where we have developed a priesthood, where they have developed a nuclear priesthood. They, and he compared themselves to the pharaohs and the ancient people who had the priesthood who dished out the knowledge to the masses. And it was now up to the nuclear scientists to protect the safety of the planet. Well, I would say that they summarily failed, 100% failed, which gets me screaming and yelling here, but I'll make an effort to contain myself. <laughs> but um, he also, in that article, this is why I decided to read it. I dug it up for a scientific research paper that I couldn't use for my school. But in the article, he's, this was the first time he said that nuclear scientists have created a Faustian bargain with the people of the Earth. Because in order for us to provide a, quote, clean, free energy, endless amount of energy, we have to give our trust to the nuclear scientists to protect the world and the safety of the world. Now, that, that idea might have been really workable if the basis of the nuclear energy industry had been based on truth. But the basis of the nuclear energy industry has been based on lies from the get-go. They did not tell us from the get-go it would cause um, the waste that we can't still deal with. They didn't tell us for 20 years that they had waste that we couldn't figure out what to do with. But they kept using it and kept doing it. And in, when they went to the Marshall Islands and bombed the Bikini Islands, they did not tell those people near the harm and in fact the boat sh drove right past them right after you know right after they were about to drop the bomb they came back to look after they dropped the bomb they walked right past the islands and left the people on the islands um there's a really great documentary that i have called half life it was done in 1972 by an australian and he has video clips of the people actually, what actually happened, and he shows the children who are lying there with cerebral palsy, it's such a sad state because those children laid in their huts, those people had no idea. The Marshallese actually called, you know, the, the, the term uh, jelly babies came because they gave birth to children that they could not even imagine. Their exposure rate was so high. You've seen these grotesque photos of the babies that don't look human. So our job now is to, we, we can't really look backwards. We can't call these, you know, they are nuclear liars. The whole thing has been based on a lie. It's important for us to understand the history of the nuclear lies and how they basically made an effort to convince Americans that the nuclear power industry, that the nuclear energy industry was conscientious and looking after our best interests, which is what I believed 100% the day Fukushima happened. The day that Fukushima happened, I remember them thinking, oh my God, I'm so glad they were able to use the ocean water to cool down the nuclear power plants. And I went about my business thinking that the nuclear power plants were fine, perfectly fine. You know, unbeknownst to me, I had no idea that was probably the worst thing that they could have done for those nuclear power plants. It only exacerbated the problem. It was as if they did nothing, and in fact, it was worse than doing nothing. They made it worse than doing nothing by pouring salt water on the nuclear power plants. And every government on this planet should have been actively engaged. Think of the military power that we have on our planet, that we could have actually stopped Fukushima four years ago. I'm not sure that we can right now. So 
Our job now is to learn how to deal with it because we can't stop it. And it's going to take a lot of, it's still going to take all the world governments to try to figure it out. And in the meantime, we have billions of people on this planet who are like frogs in a pot of hot water trying to figure out, you know, is it getting too hot? Only there's no other planet to go to. We only have one planet to live on. So it's up to us to decide how to live well, how to be happy and face this within the courage of it, how to get the masses of the people to acknowledge that this is a serious problem that we need to demand our governments take action on immediately. Not tomorrow, not five years from now, but right now. We, our governments really need to be actively engaged, every government on the planet, stopping Fukushima. In my view, Fukushima is probably the worst catastrophe that's ever happened and ever will have happened, except that we have a <laughs> ticking time bombs all around the world, these same things. And I think the fact that the nuclear industry knows they have these ticking time bombs, you know, Kevin often used the phrase, kick the can down the road. It's not just kicking the can down the road. They are, com they are in complete denial that there is a huge problem. They, they cannot acknowledge even a half an ounce of responsibility because if they did, then they'd have to acknowledge everything else. It's like a little thing of dominoes that spins around. And you've seen those videos where they have all these complicated things. You know, the basketball hits the ping pong ball and then the other thing hits and the other thing hits. And it's just like this whole thing just comes down. And that's kind of where we're at. And the only problem is the whole thing that's going to come down is life on our planet. So as an eternal optimist, and I really do believe this, I think there is a solution to this. I think that once there's enough political pressure on our governments, that they will find a solution. I mean, I have done a lot of reading on what's called sound healing. And I intuitively believe that that's where it will go because sound moves molecules. And I think maybe that's a solution. One of the things I wanted to do today, though, uh, and I promised you that I would have this interview. You know, my show is called The Age of Fission. And this brilliant artist that worked with us in the Post-Ignorance Project was is Thomas Ackerman, H. Thomas Ackerman. He's an artist who has been um, really very well known in the art world in his own time. And he lives up in Canada. He's still... So for me, I'm in awe of a human being who can actually make a decent living selling his artwork. I think that's completely awesome. And uh, he came up with this idea of the age of fission. That was his idea. He put out a video maybe a year and a half ago talking about we are now in the age of fission. And he has come up with an idea to help us as a culture move into the idea of accepting the age of fission because once we accept that we're in the age of fission, a lot of brilliant minds can come to us. A lot of people just shut out the idea that there's no solution to this problem in Fukushima and to the nuclear power mess that has been created by the nuclear priesthood. So I want to talk, I'm going to introduce to you uh, Thomas Ackerman. Thomas, are you on the phone? Can you hear me? I can oh. hear you. Wonderful. Wonderful. Lonnie thank, Clark. Thank you for being here. Thank, thank you for sharing and thank you for the brilliant idea of the age of fission. Well, first of all, it's always uh, fantastic to get a call from Lonnie Clark, uh, a warrior of conscience. You know how I go on about conscience. And I think you're a frontliner on that. On, on our behalf, in terms of conscience, what I say to do the right thing. And I, uh, I, I just get a thrill when you give me a call and say hello and we have our discussions and uh, at the end of it i feel a hell of a lot better than i did before i talked to you well thank you me too actually and so and uh the other part uh first to uh i'm also uh, really honored that you uh chose this title for your radio program the age of fission you said oh tom can i use it and i said bloody right you use it i mean that's fabulous that's like uh you know the understanding is uh uh I don't know why I, I thought of this, uh, you know, age of fission, probably some historical stuff that goes through my mind. But the fact that you decided to use that, I think you could have also said uh, conscience radio. I think that would have been uh, pretty good too, would describe your uh, nature. But I'm thrilled you used the uh, age of fission. Well, for me, the age of fission is really the fundamental reason why 
every single day I wake up and try to figure out what's going on in Fukushima and what nuclear lie is out there perpetrating harm to unknown suspects, you know, un unsuspecting people. That's my thing is like, I was completely unsuspecting when Fukushima happened. I ignored it for a year and a half. I mean, I had a nightmare on May 5th, 2012 that got me actively engaged in this. I did not know Kevin Blanche. I did not know about YouTube. I had never really been on YouTube prior to that date. The only reason I went onto YouTube is because that's the only place that I could find information about Fukushima. I saw a video by Miss Milky the Clown, and frankly, it was hilarious. It was the funniest thing I'd ever seen in my life. It was like, this is hilariously funny because she... You know, she put in those little comments. She would report the real hard, grotesquely difficult news to digest and insert a little video clip that, that like, you know, humans can only take so much, right? So at just the right time when it would just become too oppressive, there was like a little bit of a humor that kept me actively engaged. And it was such a brilliant way of doing it. And then I started researching and really looking around, you know, and... We really, it is, it made me realize how, you know, in sales there's a phrase that says, you don't know what you don't know until you know you don't know it, right? <laughs> and that's where we're at right now. <laughs> <laughs> well, you know, if you want to, uh, I, I also, uh, yeah, uh, Miss Milky the Clown, I, I, I think everybody knows it's Jan Brooks and her material that she exposed was so crucial in terms of uh, the facts, just the facts, ma'am, right? It's like uh, Sergeant Friday, uh, the female version of uh, Sergeant Friday, just the facts, ma'am. And she was just extraordinary on digging this stuff up. And um, actually, I think that uh, as a sort of, you know, for to, to a clarification, I, I've mentioned this on my YouTubes, but the idea of the age of fission is something that go back i think uh root the, the 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 seed of this is in 1938 when a couple of uh physicists uh strassman and uh han in germany or austria i'm not sure actually uh discovered not discovered invented plutonium 94. now apparently fermi had uh done a similar thing in 1932 but had no clue what the hell was going on and in 1938 these two germans figured out uh, how to invent a new element for the periodic table, and it was uh, a lethal toxic uh, element. And I believe that's when I thought of the age of fission, when I researched that. So we've been in the age of fission since that uh, invention of plutonium-94 for people that uh, want to sort of see a little bit of a background here. And uh, the, uh, the information is unequivocal, and I know there are people that are saying, well, you know, you're, you're not a scientist, you're not this, you're not that. And I agree, I'm not a scientist, but I've got a heart beating in my chest and uh, I'm still connected to some form of reason and logic and the two together create conscience. So uh, I think the age of fission is a combination of what you're now starting to talk about on, on the radio about uh, just really accepting this on some level that it's impossible to deny. Denial means destruction, annihilation. And uh, how do we proceed? And, you know, you and I talk about this. And uh, the idea of, uh, I, I kind of look at it like uh, three phases. I, I figured out two phases, maybe the third. Can, can, I, can I talk about that? Sure, but I do want to interject this one idea. Okay, you know, go ahead. You said, oh, I'm not a scientist. Well, that, for me, Neither you nor I are scientists, but that is the function of science, is to put scientific data in a way so that people can comprehend it. That's why we have scientists. We have scientists to share their mathematical and knowledge, their mathematical capacity, their ability to digest complicated concepts and boil them down into something that is useful to humanity. So we don't have to be scientists. We don't, people always say, well, I'm not an expert. I can't really tell. Well, we don't need to be experts. We need to be able to rely on the scientists. And that is really the fundamental thing. In the age of fission, what went awry is the scientists withheld and actually manipulated the information to not disclose the truth. And unfortunately, in real science, 
the truth is evident. You can't have a hypothesis and have a preconceived idea at the beginning. You know what I mean? Yeah. So yes. Yes. That's the only thing I want to interject is that as regular people, we have a right to look at this information and digest it and say, Wow, maybe we are, you know, you came up with this concept of the age of vision after understanding and doing some re research and how did this stuff get created? And a yeah. light went on in your head. You said, wow, we've been in the age of vision since 1938. Right. And nobody knew it. As opposed to the nuclear age, which is a misnomer from the point of view. Well, we are in the nuclear age, have been for four and a half billion years since the uh, so-called origin of this planet. There has been radiation uh, emerging out of this planet, uranium uh, is uh, naturally in the ground. Uh, we have dealt with that as a biological entity. All life forms deal with the background radiation. Uh, native cultures uh, were smart enough to stay away from the hills that had uranium in it. They uh, barred their people from uh, hanging around those places because they knew it was dangerous. But we managed to handle the radiation that is nuclear, but uh, fission, nuclear fission more precisely, is the splitting of the atom, which as far as I have uh, come across in my research, does not exist in the rest of the universe. And people will say, well, you know, uh, there is a natural reactor at Gabon, Africa, and uh, it's a fission reactor. It's naturally occurring. Well, this is supposedly uh, like a billion and a half years ago or something. Who the hell knows what happened? At billion and a half years ago. You know, it's like my shopping list from last week is a puzzle for me. So, you know, it's like, how, how would anybody know? But smart science, as far as I can tell, does not agree, uh, except possibly on the periphery of, of supernova, there may be uh, fission, nuclear fission occurring, but everything else is fusion, fusion, the sun. So the age of fission is an age that probably applies only to this planet in the entire cosmos. So imagine that. Yeah, that I mean, it, what's really interesting about that is that's a good idea, though. I, if you could expand on that a little bit, I'd really like you to talk very briefly because I do want to move on to our conversation about the free radicals. OK, but this is something that really confuses, frankly, even me. This took me a long time to get this idea. And I imagine there's a lot of people who aren't like me. I'm not a scientific mind. I get confused between the word fission, fusion. You say fission is the splitting of the atom. Would you explain what fusion is? Because the media, you know, when I really appreciate the idea that you say we've been living in the age of nuclear for mil millions of years, did you say? Millions. Billions. billions, right. Yes. Billions. So we the age of and so they manipulate that to say, oh well, we've always had radiation, but we've never had fission. We've never had the age of fission where man created a new element to the periodic table. But if you would, would you explain in simple terms, because you have a really gift for that, what fusion is? Well, I, I probably uh, I, I make. Uh... I'm not sure. I, I'm making fission paintings right now. I, I haven't really been able to uh, think about fusion because it's not an issue uh, for us because it exists no matter what. It's the sun. And the sun is not necessarily uh, when, when you supposedly get beyond the uh, Earth's atmosphere and those, the, magnetic, uh, the magnetics that protect us from the ultraviolet. Uh, fusion is not a problem for us uh, the way fission is because we've created, a, we've created well, it's a monster because uh, Dana Durnford un understands as I, I, he'd be a great guest as well to explain uh, this part of it. But basically, uh, uh, conceptually, even to split something, uh, to uh, it's not creating fusion creates atoms and fission destroys atoms. So the fu the fundamental principle behind the two aspects of nuclear one is creative, one is destructive. And uh, that doesn't mean that we can, you know, stand in direct ultraviolet light and survive. But uh, the way we're structured is we're able to metabolize uh, what part of fusion we experience. But fission is something the biological organisms cannot metabolize because it keeps on what is called, well, cancer is basically uncontrolled cell growth. And I think this is uh, a chain reaction, an uncontrolled chain reaction in a physical environment is very much like cancer and it's uncontrolled cell growth 
And uh, that's what we're facing in the age of fission, uncontrolled cell growth, which will manifest itself in biological forms as mutations uh, and uh, cancers. And, uh, I, and I think that somebody that has a grasp of the two processes will, will acknowledge that fusion is everywhere in the cosmos, as far as we can tell, and fission does not exist. That's great. Thank you. Thank you for that quick synopsis. And that brings us about to this idea that in the age of fission, we actually really need to learn how to live in the age of fission because it's not going away. It's not going away ever. And so while we're trying to figure out a way to save the planet and we're encouraging the scientists to really develop and be honest and get back to science instead of manipulating and, you know, kowtowing to their uh, pay, the to their, the money lords, really, the people who own the money who control them. We really need to embrace this. And our goal here, at least my goal, is to get people, encourage them to appreciate living and utilize their resources to the best they can to really make an impact, to get people to change their lifestyles, to get actively engaged. You know, there's somebody put a comment on uh, one of my videos that, <clears throat> hate to break your bubble, but... Uh, you know, with the Illuminati and the, the the people who are controlling the planet, we're all just toast, and you might as well just brace yourself for the end. I, I'm personally, <laughs> I'm just not willing to just give in and, you know, pile up a stock load of bullets and guns and, you know, five years worth of food and hope I can make it through the so-called hell that's about to ensue. I have a higher sense of humanity. I think that as humans, we are going to pull together when it gets to be a critical mass when they can no longer hide it. I mean, we're coming on that time. We're almost five years into Fukushima. It is a known fact that many of the worst events from nuclear contamination start presenting themselves after five years. That's when low-level radiation creates you know, the lower and not even just the higher exposure, but those after five years is when you get start to see very severe things happen. And that's aside from the fact that the nuclear power plants are crumbling. Like what, what did ENE News say this week? There's the sign, the, it, there's massive signs that the buildings of Fukushima are sinking. Wow. Well, if they're sinking, that means that at some point they're going to collapse. Wow. And no. we need to be prepared for that. People need not to be shocked that that's going to happen. You know what I'm saying? It is probably an inevitability at this point. I don't know if we are any government or any agency has the capacity to stop it. So in the meantime, I want us to talk about the free radicals to get a movement going through the use of art and people's artistic expression because art is an expression of our love of life. And so that is how we, I, and I really agree with this idea about this. And we can actually share information about how we can protect ourselves through health and nutrition. Because that is, and I really believe that humans have the capacity to change. You know, people say, well, I don't want to have to change. Well, you know, the fact is everybody does change. Whether you say you want to or not, you're changing. So we're, I, my goal is just to put information out there Talk to activists and tell us what the truth is. And I really also want to speak about the social engineering. But let's get back to the free radicals. If you would, please give a quick synopsis of what your view is of your idea and your brilliant inception about the free radical movement, what we can do in a way to help people acknowledge the catastrophe that's going on in Fukushima. Okay, as a, can I can I, as a preamble to the free radicals, just uh, uh, I want to I want to say a few things about that. But w remember, uh, we talked to, you, you brought up hormesis. I, I'd like to just kind of oh, touch yeah. on that for a minute because that's a really important point. Okay. Uh, as uh, since since if 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 you if you kind of ex well if you can accept we're in the age of fission, then hormesis is almost a natural product of that because there has to be. Uh, some kind of campaign to get us to accept the fact that uh, radiation from a chain reaction, from a uh, nuclear fission chain reaction, is actually an acceptable uh, condition for for us. And I, I think you brought this up. Uh, hormesis is basically uh, a philosophy. Uh, I call it a mantra, probably, of accepting uh, lethal radiation as a uh, 
a natural phenomenon now. Is that is that? Kind of, that yeah, that's sort of what they're trying to frame it in the back of our heads. Like, don't be worried about Fukushima. Don't worry about those nuclear power plants all over the east that are about to just start falling apart because we're, we can show you that low levels of radiation actually help your body cope with higher right. levels of radiation. Right. The idea like vaccination uh, is a kind of preemptive strike right. against the... Uh, to let the immune system kick in. And idea. they really are going after that seriously hard. There's, I know here in the Northwest, you know, we have these little mini nuclear power plants that they are trying to build. And they're actually starting to say that there is a huge movement. with. And actually, if people would go to thehill.com and just look at the front page, there's a little red button. When you go to the energy and, energy and environment section of that, it's sponsored by the, it says sponsored hyphen uh, America's nuclear future or something like that. I forget the exact title, but it's in red. It's little tiny fonts. If you click on it, these are all propaganda videos. They look like news articles written by a real journalist. They look like a, there was one where uh, they were sitting inside. It was completely inco unconscionable sitting inside of the, Ca the United States Capitol Senate building, and a woman was interviewing a guy, talking, talking to a gentleman, interviewing him about nuclear energy and how some people are trying not to, there's a movement, there's a, you know, people are beginning to get nervous about nuclear energy, but what they're trying to do is promote it, and so what they were saying is that the guy was saying, well, we've got legislation going on, like in the state of Illinois, where we are going to be allowing people to understand that low-level radiation just isn't that harmful. Yeah, right. Now, that, but this is on thehill.com, a very well-respected, you know, Internet. I mean, it, it was a shock to me because it's, it was like, you know, remember a few years ago they, they showed us that the Fox News had these um, uh, news articles that where they had these interviews and things like that, and they weren't actually news at all. They were just like advertisements for Georgia Pacific, you know? <laughs> yeah. and that's right. all it really was. And that that actually went to the Supreme Court. The Supreme Court said you can do whatever you want. It, you know, in America at least, the uh, news agencies do not have to tell the truth. That yeah. they can say whatever they want. They can lie, as because it's all about the profit here in the states. But well, this is interesting because, and I say interesting from the point of view that you, you mentioned acceptance, and this is a really perverse, depraved sort of uh, angle of acceptance. You see, we're actually going into this phase, and I, I want to just mention the idea of phase one, two, three, and I think the first phase was a level of anger and rage, uh, and now I think we're in phase two, and, and they get it, they get it. People are going to begin to accept, but to accept that radiation is is normal for our bodies is the most insane conclusion uh, for anyone to come to based on all the evidence that we have. But the idea of hormesis, I, I tied in with, I, I did a little research on, uh, on Darwin, the origin of species and natural selection. And there's an excellent biologist, uh, you can find him on YouTube, called Jonathan Wells. He's a biologist. And he's basically uh, understanding mutations. And the idea that we come from uh, amino acids that swim around in some weird kind of soup and then it turns into life. Uh, well, you know, I would even go further back than amino acids and say, how would an amino acid organize itself? You know, how, how do you actually end up or, or get to the point where you have some kind of a concoction that literally establishes life in the first place? Then you have like uh, billions of years of single cellular organisms, supposedly, that all of a sudden explode at the, uh, uh, I don't know what that age is called, uh, um, it has a name. Anyway, there's like an explosion 500 and some million years ago. You have uh, thousands and hundreds, millions of, uh, of, uh, of creatures appearing out of nowhere all of a sudden, and it miraculous, miraculously <laughs> is supposedly mutation. Now think of this, Lonnie. When I was listening to this fellow, he said there are three types of mutation as far as biology is concerned. Number one, the mutation that affects an organism or it mutates an organism and it has no effect on its physical function. In other words, it just continues to work uh, perfectly normally. The second type of mutation is when it severely 
hinders that organism. Whatever mutation you get, it always severely hinders the function of that organism. And the third mutation is death of the organism. So there, in, in the Darwinian idea that mutation, for example, that we are radiated now by uh, uh, isotopes from chain reactions, ionized radiation could possibly be beneficial based on the Darwinian idea is total bogus because there's no evidence that any mutation has any benefit the way it's being described or being attempted to be described through hormesis or even you know some kind of Darwinian plan that, that is being reactivated that people basically have, have you know, just discarded. I mean, it, it doesn't work, this uh, uh, bogus There philosophy. has been one scientific, in fact, that's the guy that Dana exposed down in uh, New Mexico who's been... Uh, Gilmitty. Gilmitty, Gil that's right. He's yes. been testing little, you know, beagles for the last 30 years to try to find a level of radiation that won't kill them. He has yet to find, I mean, <clears throat> instead of, <clears throat> I beg your pardon, instead of having a scientific conclusion that this is this this type of energy is the, we don't have enough knowledge to actually put it into use yet no we don't i mean the the idea it's very exciting that we have discovered this concept and we have the ability to take apart a new you know an atom and make it really work but we this is what goffman said he wasn't against nuclear. He was against using nuclear. His suggestion to the government was, don't for sure don't use it to create energy. But we really, he suggested very strongly that we put it, we put as much money into it as we did the military to really figure out how to use this capacity before we use it because it is so highly toxic. He and Tamplin had definitive evidence, and Linus Pauling, by the way, had definitive evidence that nuclear in no way is beneficial to living organisms. It is the, the splitting of the atom and creating fission is excessively harmful to life on the planet. And that's it in a nutshell. Exactly, exactly. And there is no uh, uh, <laughs> modern mantra of hormesis that will uh, mitigate our mind, our logic, our reason to accept something as ridiculous that nuclear radiation is a beneficial aspect to our day-to-day -day life. Like, uh, like Darwin said that, uh, you know, I'm sure there are a lot of people that are, are Darwin uh, believers, uh, because that's what it is. It's another form of religion, Darwinism. But that there is some kind of acceptance now, which that's frightening to me, because whatever we're able to accomplish through our YouTubes and, and the activism that we have, People that are uh, involved, that have a dog in this fight in terms of money from the nuclear industry are going to try to, to, to re derail us. This acceptance is not that it's beneficial or it's all right, but that we're in it. I mean, uh, it's bad and we're in it, you know, so let's, let's figure this out now. We're not, right. uh, oh, we're doing all right because a little bit is okay and the more you get, the more likely you're uh, able to survive. So. Anyway, well, that's I, the interesting thing, the way they manipulate. It's really, this is why I must, in, the, in, in, in this radio show, we must discuss uh, social engineering. Because it is an intrinsic part of getting people to accept the slow suicide that nuclear radiation will do to our planet. And yeah. that's exactly what they're doing. You know, uh, two years ago, I mean, I guess it was, what, 2012 in Oregon, uh, my own congressman, Pete DeFazio, was being challenged by a Republican who, <clears throat> one of his talking points was that he thought radiation was great for the human body. He suggested that it, this was right after Fukushima. It was so incredulous. Is he married to Ann Coulter? <clears throat> well, actually, Ann Coulter is another one. You know, Ann Coulter started falling. Art Robinson is a, a Republican, and Ann Coulter was... They had Ann Coulter go on the television and say that, you know, a little bit of radiation doesn't hurt you. And she sounded like a <laughs> lunatic then, right? That was three, four, five years ago. Art yeah. Robinson summarily lost. Like he was asking people, he literally was asking people in Oregon to mail him their, their urine. <laughs> so that he wanted to do scientific studies so that he could show that a little bit of radiation was actually beneficial 
to humanity in the future. And this is their big mantra. And they are, this is why I suggest people going to the, the hill.com to look at the insidious ways that the people who run the nuclear cartel, the nuclear industry, they are very willing to do whatever. And this tells you how deep the corruption goes. They own the media, essentially. And so, and not just in America, but in, you know, like in Japan, I mean, the reason that there's secrecy acts in Japan is because of the media, because the media and the government work together. And so they are all, it's really, for me, I still have not been able to comprehend how they can ignore the facts to their own detriment. It's irrational, Lonnie, it's irrational. It reminds me of Caligula. I used to offhandedly call these people Caligula, you know what I mean? But the fact is, you know, Caligula collapsed, the whole Roman Empire collapsed under its own weight of denial. Yeah. And that's where we're headed. And so I believe, frankly, I do believe that this is going to collapse. But what my goal is, is to help people. Somebody's going to survive. We're not all going to just die. It's not going to go away in a day, in a decade, in a hundred years. Civilizations that take thousands of years take five, six hundred years to collapse. And it transforms. There's no like collapse. It transforms into something else. So my goal is to help us really during this period of time, humans only live for a hundred years or so, to have us really embrace our lives and to really appreciate living and to stay healthy as much as we can. There are things we can do to keep healthy and it's, you know, that's the other part of the propaganda is to demean the quote health, the health benefits of eating healthy. You know, but, yeah. you know, you, you have these people, I went off on this camping trip in the Redwoods recently, and one of my campmates says, well, I, you know, who cares? I'm not going to change my ways. I'm, I don't care about eating organic. He's like, I, I'm old. It doesn't matter. I said, really, it doesn't matter to you if you die in pain or, you know, I mean, like, we need to help people get inspired to live and enjoy themselves. And, and it was really hilarious because... You know, these people had to spend four days, three days in a camp with me. <laughs> and frankly, wow. I'm I'm a bit of a character, and I I have a sense of humor that's a little bit odd. And I really believe in living life. Like we need to just em embrace life and live life and enjoy life. Like I, people say to me, "Well, doesn't it make you depressed to think about this?" Well, frankly, facing the age of fission makes me feel inspired. Because we're not going back. Like, I love the idea that we're the first generation who gets to acknowledge that we're living in the age of fission. It's been going on since 1938, in my view. You know, you said 1938. And I was thinking, I actually, that was news to me, but that's fabulous. Because that speaks to why it actually really gives me a big answer. And that's the value of this radio show. Through our conversation today, I learned something and it connected a dot. I considered mm -hmm. the age of fission since the day that Fukushima fell apart. But actually, it's not. It's been since 1938. So we've had like 50, 60 years of complete denial, which is why it seems like such a surprise to people. So we get the opportunity to really embrace our real life, the real reality of living in the world today. We're not... We're not pretending that it's something that it's not. We get to be liberated. Like we get to d get, for me, facing the age of fission allows me to get divorced from the nuclear liars. Yeah. You know, because yeah. we can now embrace it and create something new. I think also if, if you know, with my own, I, my expertise has been uh, making paintings. And uh, I think that everybody has a gift. I, I'm, I'm convinced of this. We, we, we all look different, and there's a reason for that. I, I think, think that there are examples to each other of uh, a form of genius, a, a kind of uh, multiplicity and complexity that obviously we don't understand. And then a few manipulators come in and try to take the field and the platform on, this, on, on hijacking the idea of this genius that each of us has. And just think about the idea of progress. If you ever get into a discussion with people that talk about progress, and, and I frankly, I get hammered. Uh, it's, it's sort of fun for me now to, to engage people on this idea that I have. And I, I often say, you know, I'd gladly give up. I'd gladly live in a mud hut with wood shoes if I could get rid of nuclear right now. There is absolutely no doubt in my mind or any restriction to that 
I would live in a mud hut with wood shoes if nuclear did not exist. Nuclear fission was not part of my life. Now, the idea, think of this, Lonnie, that progress would naturally have some kind of connection to survival. I, I think there's no point in being scientific or brilliant or intellectual or smart and have the greatest art in the history of the cosmos and you end up dead at the other end. It, exactly. it makes no sense, right? Exactly. Yeah, so, you know, when I look, when I look at a painting, uh, it has to sustain me. And I mean, sustenance isn't just like eating and whatever. You know, once you have sort of your basics taken care of, then you're, you're trying to expand and embrace this complexity because it's so uh, humongous, this mystery that we face all the time. So, Well, the I idea- think that as humans, we are inclined to expand. Like we, when you consider that we have this brain on the top of our head that we barely use, right? Which allows us, it gives us, we have tremendous potential. And it's not just the potential. We have the ability to really put it into action, but... What we have been trained through social engineering is to demean ourselves on a constant chronic basis and not take action and to just accept being battered and badgered. And I think the age of fission is going to free all of us from that mantra of, you know, you can't do anything, you can't be anything, because it is going to take every single human being using their brains, using their capacities to really want to live, to embrace it, even through the trials. I mean, I understand people have economic trials. I understand that people have physical trials, but they still have a gift. They still have an opportunity of something to help us share. Because for me, I believe that the greatest power in the universe is love. And we we have a capacity to love and express our, and I think that's where the great art comes from, the passion of love and just, you know, big anger. When somebody's really angry, it's because they have a really deep heart. They really love deeply, and they're denying or they're not allowing that love to process through their life. They get swirled up in the anger instead of allowing the love to allow them to heal. I think that the love of our planet will allow us to figure out solutions to heal, And this is why I love the idea of the free radical movement using artwork because it it encourages people to expand and accept the love that they have for our planet instead of feeling depressed about it and caving in and saying there's nothing we can do because there is plenty, plenty, plenty we can do besides going standing out in the street protesting, which I'm all about. I still think it matters. (laughs) You know, it's I think we still need to do it. Lonnie, it's, it's inspirational. You know, even a, a one individual person, you know, taking it upon themselves to have the courage to step out and not be conforming to what everybody else is doing, going to work in their cars, riding like on the freeways, whatever it is. And you're standing on that corner, on that street corner with your sign. Uh, when scientists lie, uh, we die, right? So this is like... Like a pretty uh, courageous step you've taken when you do that. And I think this is, uh, I think you're an extraordinary person, actually, from the point of view that uh, you're, you're putting into action feelings and uh, thoughts and ideas. And uh, I'm more humble about the, the love idea is, a, is an ultimate aim. I, I, I kind of call it caring that, and most people can identify caring because, you know, uh, you know, when you fall in love, uh, which is sort of, I guess, the ultimate sort of feeling. But everybody can care. You know, it's like uh, you don't have maybe falling in care. I, I don't know. Maybe that works, too. I have well, thought see, about- I think that's been part of the social engineering is like to demean the word love because love is a very powerful emotion. It is. Yeah. And this is yeah. why we have a culture where women and men walk away from their children uh, because they have been so I don't I'm not angry at people who can't cope with the idea that they've reproduced and they don't want the responsibility because they've been socially engineered to walk away. But until we acknowledge these things, we are not going to figure out solutions to them. You know, it's important to talk about Bernays who intentionally set about doing the social engineering to break up the modern culture and to create a bunch of lemmings who will just click their heels and say oh well there's nothing i can do about it so i'm never going to get actively engaged and that's kind of, know, that's where the masses of the people are did you know that bernays was i think he was freud sigmund freud's nephew yes i do know that i mean that's and, 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 
Yeah, it, it's it's kind of weird. And he, I think he was the guy that coined uh, uh, manufacturing consent or something. He uh, he was the guy behind Goebbels probably and all that. Uh, no doubt. Uh, no doubt. And in fact, you know, you know my theory. I, we talked about that over a year ago. I I think that the whole uh, Nazi movement moved into our government after World War II. Yeah, you said that in your last program, uh, paperclip stuff. The uh, yeah, uh, they they kind of transposed themselves from Europe to uh, to North America. You know, quite effectively, uh, I would might add. Look at the that hate would that, be a, look at that the vitriol would be that's interview. going on in our country. Does not remind you about the vitriol that happened right before. You know, when yeah. the Nazis were in full swing, I mean, yeah. people were just so hateful and they did not care about their fellow humans. And so, you know, these are things we can stop and these are things that we can transform and change it around. I mean, I really believe that, like, the reason that the peace movement died, the women's movement died is because men, after the women's burned their bra, men were beginning to get liberated. Right. And it's bad enough to let the women be liberated, but God forbid that men get liberated. <laughs> you know, so they. I re- <laughs> yeah, well, we. It's sort of like mummy in front of me. You know, I remember as a kid, I was always hold on to my mother's, uh, to my mother's uh, dress. You know, uh, I remember this when I was maybe four, three, four. I still remember this. So maybe that never goes away, you know, you hold on to... uh... Well, that's, I think, why they didn't mind women getting liberated, because, frankly, women spend a lot of their time caring for children. They don't have the time to get active. If men got liberated, if the, you know, while women are busy having children and, you know, doing the primary caretaking of babies, which is the essential part of life, men, if men in our culture actually got liberated and felt empowered... I mean, how many men do we know that you and I have talked to who look at us and just say, well, there's, what can I, what a sense of uh, deflation that a lot of people feel when you face the age of fission, when you actually are starting to talk about it with them. And yet, as as, as people, this is why I think role modeling is such a critical thing. People see us actively engaged and continuing and persevering and Working through the issues, responding like Eric Oppenheimer's comment at the beginning, you know, stop yelling at your listeners. We're the people who are on your side. We, you know, we really, and responding with intelligent discourse instead of just being angry and telling people to shut the fuck up. You know what I mean? Like, really, it is really going to take all of us, and it takes all of us to digest ideas and share information like you shared the information about 1938 to me, which is immediately a little light went off in my head and said, wow, this is when this is when the, the real propaganda started was when they and, and in fact, it probably really upholds my theory that the Nazis in, came into the United States. <laughs> like, I think the United States was not about to let any other nation have that information. So they said, okay, we'll just bring you here and you can do and we, you know, the social science, I mean, it's kind of exciting to think about that when you think about it, what a success for them on their part after World War II. Like they got, you know, they got Bernays, they got those nuclear scientists, they created the healthcare for profit system, the prison for profit system, the food for profit system. I mean, they've destroyed the little farmer, they've destroyed the mom and pop stores. What a complete freaking success they've had. They have been- now we got to take it back. Now we got to take it back. And before we're finished, maybe I should introduce the free radical concept. <laughs> Please do. We have about um, eight minutes left. Okay. So uh, uh, we got to take it back. Everything that you're saying, we, we have to somehow, I feel I got I to gotta take it back. I can't back off on this. Uh, no matter how difficult and even with threats uh, which which have happened and people that are active will will be threatened by people that can't uh, that don't want things to change even though they may not be uh, that way there's a conformity that people just kind of get back into and and myself too I mean that's when I make paintings and I repeat myself I'm not happy I, I always have to keep moving and changing and this was the idea of the free radicals and, you know, my history with my colleagues has always been very uh, uh, a kind of uh, not necessarily selfish, but maybe egotistical. And I think the free radical is the opposite to the idea of uh, of a singular artist and uh, living in that kind of uh, 
uh, myopic ego. And the free radical was, uh, wasn't really thought out at the beginning. It was just kind of like a word that flowed between a buddy and myself. And let's have a, let's start a group. Let's do a group. Let's do free radicals. And then what, what I understood in this is that through the process in my own painting, what I've developed a certain way of working, it was very conducive to using that pro process that I've developed on my own work to include other artists. And it's a personal transition for me to get out of my ego. It's like I'm the only one that know, knows how to make a meaningful, beautiful, fantastic painting uh, and acknowledge the fact that this, this understanding I, I, I sort of, I, I grew into because of this Fukushima thing, I realized I, I cannot do this by myself. This has to be a community. And, and you're a free radical, by the way, because you did the walk. You, you did the uh, uh, walk from, you remember that video? Yes. So there were, there were probably about 30 or so uh, free radical videos. I was actually hoping that there would be thousands uh, and I would have like huge numbers of one minute videos of people walking, but that's all right. You know, well, 30, there will be good. thousands as we continue. You know, people can still do the free radical videos. In fact, I was was going to interject. I'm actually was going to be doing one up at Crater Lake. I'm going to make an effort to do a free radical video. I regret not having the time when I was up in uh, the Redwoods to do a free radical walk, but we were walking on Walking out of nothing into the camera, like a minute or less, you know, walking out of some uh, sort of a nebulous kind of scene or whatever, out of nothing, right past the camera, showing your face walking right past the camera. That was basically the idea. And a couple of days ago, a person said, oh, what's the big deal of that? How stupid is that? And I said, all right, how stupid is that? Imagine if you have thousands, tens of thousands of people doing that. Do you realize the community that would be created just through those videos and a museum showing this? And it wouldn't be this uh, Brian Eno banal thousand pictures or a million pictures, right? He creates a million pictures with Photoshop. This is like real souls with brilliance walking into the camera, creating community. That's, that's sort of how I felt about the free radical and extending myself out of my myopic ego and uh, giving other people uh, that, you know, whatever vision that I have about joining to counter the age of vision or to accept what we're in now through this artistic process. And it's, there's painting involved as well, which is a whole other level, but simply we'll have, to have you back to talk about that we're sort of running out of time okay. so let me ask you this would you be willing to come back say on a regular i don't know if you could do this every week but maybe every other week where we could have a conversation yeah you i i absolutely and uh you know maybe once a month or twice a month or something like that because i don't know if i have anything else to add maybe updates on where i'm going with the free radicals i'm trying to contact museums and work with people to actually get this into the public domain because I think it is a really important movement, the free radical movement. And the idea, the delivery system that I have developed would be a, a facility, it would, be, it would facilitate this community feeling. That's what I want to do through the creative side of things. So uh, that's the free radicals. I think that's a great idea. And that is actually, that's the point of this show too, is to create community with people and to, and to empower people to actually open themselves up to the ideas that they have something to contribute. Exactly. And, and it's not just a death sentence accepting that we're going to live in the age of fission. There's actually a lot of life, a lot of joy. We may not be able to change the fission state that we're in, but we may be able to really push for solutions from the scientists. In the meantime, we create community and spread and share a lot of love and joy with each other. And I think that really matters. And, and don't forget the fact that each person, I believe, has their own vision, whichever way that's formulated. Right. And uh, the free radicals will focus that within the process that... Uh, and, and, and frankly, I would really, me personally, I would love to get all those activists who were very instrumental in stopping nuclear in the mid-80s, in the late 80s.